uh, as these technologies come together to to help facilitate progress, I feel over the next decade, we're going to see the fastest rate of technological advancement that we've ever seen in in the in history not not correlated to the, the to fastest any... rate of technological advancement in the in the next decade yeah it, in the west in the us el salvador or whatever countries are uh, it's to... not going to have borders it's going to be it's going to be global could you give us a few simple examples of how our lives could be different or will be different uh, in 10 years compared to today what will be so radically different what can we expect what should we prepare for um i mean it's, it's hard to envision exactly all the ways that that this will be be implemented right but i could give you a couple of examples now right and we just talked about content generation so the the film and entertainment industry instead of needing two thousand people to make a game you might need 10 right i mean a huge huge reduction in need of of staff and the reason for that is because those 10 people are doing the work with ai of those 2000 people so it's welcome to dig life deep with john aiden burn Mark Seal, welcome to my show. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> well, I just got to begin uh, by asking you about what it's like to be living and working and leading a company, Sortium, in El Salvador, a young man from New York originally. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, and, and originally, we had no intentions of, of being in El Salvador. Uh, a lot of people ask us if it had to do with Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency, and ultimately the answer is no. Um, the, when Sortium was founded, it was there's three founders. There's myself as CEO. There's Evan, who's our COO, and, and Alex uh, is our CTO. And the three of us, um, I was we we ended up in Miami together, and we started the company there. And from from there, Alex actually had been living in in El Salvador. He's he's has a, a wife and and family here. Um, he's American. He, he's he's from the states, and just through his life had moved to to El Salvador. Um, and we had him in Miami, and we were working together. And then he was like, "Well, you have to come to El Salvador now." and see my home and work with some of the team that I have there. So we did, and we loved it. Um, the, the team was great. The people are, are incredible. The culture here is amazing. So we just kind of evolved into that. We put our, our main office, or not our main office, we put our development office here and started building our, our team. Um, and, and that was kind of, that was kind of it. You know, it was, it was, really by chance that Alex was here already and invited us. Uh, and then we started getting getting more and more involved, met some incredible people here that are, are working with the government, helping develop uh, the adoption of, of cryptocurrency technologies. Um, but it's it's been beautiful. We, we get to wake up every we have we have a house that we that we share, uh, Evan, myself and um, one of our other our members on the team, uh, Phil. And we get to wake up every morning, see a beautiful volcano and mountains and get go get our, our breakfast uh, at, at a, there's a coffee shop that we all love. And then we come in, come into the office uh, and it's it's great. So kind of a laid back a culture with a new entrepreneurial spirit. But speaking of all of that enterprise, um, El Salvador was quick to embrace Bitcoin a year or two ago. And it made world headlines. Um, and some people shook their heads um, and others said, go for it. Um, Bitcoin plunge, crypto collapsed, let's say, and it's sort of very volatile um, Bitcoin. Um, and it didn't leave the uh, economy where you're at in a very pretty place. It's risking default. 
I mean, I'm not tying it into Bitcoin necessarily. There are other issues, obviously, clearly there. But what's your thoughts on all of that? Well, I mean, for one, the the currency that's primarily used here is the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Right. So when when you go to the store, you go anywhere. Um, it's everything is in U.S. dollar, even though Bitcoin is accepted everywhere. It's still all priced in in the dollar. And I, I think, you know, in some ways that that causes issues for the economy on its own here mm. because they're tied to to the U.S. So when our economy has issues, they feel it tenfold. Right. Things get get more expensive. The value of the dollar goes down. I mean, they, they feel that tenfold. And then you have the speculation of the investments that they put into into Bitcoin. And especially now that Bitcoin is volatile, like all all economic vehicles are down. Right. For the most part, um, it has a, a strong impact here, I think. And, you know, it's there's a there's a whole list of other other reasons right why as as they're developing here um they they get into kind of the rough and, and you see it, it's all it's all kind of stuff right like it, there's stuff that's imported here which anything that's imported is is expensive so the one thing i will say is li- living here is not some big cost savings right um for for instance, we have gone to visit Guatemala, which is the, the neighboring country or one of the neighboring countries, and it's totally different. They are using their own currency, so the dollar there holds a lot of power. Uh, things are very inexpensive, and you can you know you you could go for a wagyu fancy steak dinner, and you're paying thirty bucks, right? Whereas here, you're paying almost what you would pay. In Miami, you're paying a couple hundred bucks to do the same same thing. So uh, I think that impacts it here as well because the it, it, they're feeling almost U.S. inflation, but the wealth here is not at the same level, right? There, there's not as much wealth of, of course, in, in the country as as there is in in the U.S. Um, so the, there's I, I think that that causes a lot of issues, and maybe. Maybe it's much deeper than that, um, perhaps mm. beyond what what my my knowledge really is. But that's kind of my take on on it from from where I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah, and that's real interesting. Uh, so the U.S. dollar is um, it's tied to the U.S. dollar there, its currency. So it doesn't give it a lot of wiggle room. It can't print its own way out of trouble. Let's say like the U.S. can because we're a reserve currency. Um, it's not, an, you know, by definition, a wealthy country, um, El Salvador, um, and um, but at the same time, it has a functioning economy. Um, tell us about that. Where do you see the future for for the country? Well, if their adoption of of crypto is fully successful, right? They're they're very. Um... You know, there's a term that gets used a lot in in the crypto space, maxi or max maximus maximalist, right? And they're very much Bitcoin only. Um, they're not really interested in, in Ethereum or the other tokens that are that are out there. And perhaps it ends up working to their benefit. Um, you know, we uh, at least at Sortium, we don't look at things that way because we don't we don't really care. We're not even crypto uh, maxis. We're technology enthusiasts, and and we want to adopt and contribute to to tech. But from the country perspective, I think if they execute this well, then what's going to happen is as adoption increases internationally for Bitcoin and crypto, it's going to be one of the few places that has had the time to really evolve um, and mature their adoption and integration. Um, And I I know for a fact that because there's... I've been involved in and, and attended um, like Lugano, Switzerland is also adopting. Zurich has been adopting. And they're also, you know, I mean, obviously Switzerland are, are their financial leaders. And they're also here. The same parties that are helping there are here. So you have a a countrywide adoption of something and you have support coming in from other smaller subsects of of other nations you have individuals wealthy individuals coming here that want to see support for that so there's an opportunity here for them that it could position them very differently in in the next 10 years um 
but it's hard to say if it will, because along that road, there's a lot of things that have to go right. They have to make all the right decisions. They have to, they have to make sure that government level corruption does not become an issue. And, and to be honest, I don't know enough about the government or, or know enough of the people here to really know or comment on how deep of an issue that may or may not be. But those are things that they have to ensure um, are covered for success. And then, of course, you have the volatility risk of Bitcoin just as, as a whole. So if they move to a complete Bitcoin infrastructure and the price fluctuates heavily, it really just depends on, on how they've set up their infrastructure to handle that, because that obviously could be an issue for them. Um, but it could also end up being a massive strength. If they have enough investment now, the next time uh, the Bitcoin hash algorithm halves, the value could drastically increase. So if adoption has also increased with that value increase, then they could be in a, an excellent position. Yeah, well, for the moment, at least, and let's hope for the future, the economy is still standing uh, because we saw all those headlines about it moving closer to a default. Um, it was pretty um, unsettling for investors. Yeah, I think it's more unsettling for investors than it is, though, for the people here. You know, people here uh, get, I'm sure, are, are frustrated because it's effectively their country's wealth that's being played with. Um, but I, investors, I, I hear investors talking about all of that, and I haven't heard a single person that lives here ever once bring that up as a topic of discussion. Yes. Uh, people, people are more worried here about living, living their lives, going to work, doing what they have to do. And again, everything is based off the U S dollar. So I don't even know if they're, they're feeling that, that default. Um, and I can tell you from the U S to here, the one, one thing that is different, I can tell you that eggs don't cost me. Forty dollars a carton here, but you know, back in New York, <laughs> there the eggs are a ridiculous price, right? So yeah, right, exactly. Uh, in, in some ways, here they they have hmm. by the sheer fact that they're not focused on. It doesn't seem like they're focused on that stuff as much. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I want to talk about sortium as well, uh, but just a quick um kind of a summary uh, as well. Um, is there employment in El Salvador widely as there a high level of unemployment, low unemployment, you know, for, for the general population, how would you describe it? Um, is there a lot of poverty, for example? Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of poverty. Um, but you know, in, in relation to what, right? Uh, yes, there's a lot of poverty. The, the capital area is, is a more wealthy area. That's primarily where we are, but you can see poverty here as well. There's certainly huge disparity between the uh, the, the wealthy uh, class living here and the, the the bottom of that, right? The individuals who who have have very very little. Um, so, for sure, that's that's an issue here. But you know, I I don't know what the ratio of that is per capita. It's I I see it here, but again, I go to New York, and I I mean I see homeless people all, all over New York. Um, I think it's an issue for for the US as well. Um, and this is a much smaller condensed country. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe those ratios are similar. They might be in a better situation than the US. I don't know. Um, as far as jobs, I mean, it seems from what I understand from who I've talked to, it seems like education is, is good here. Uh, the reason we're hiring talent here is because there's incredibly, incredibly intelligent and capable individuals in, in El Salvador and, and in Latin America in general. Um, so providing opportunities to, to bring them into the team and, and especially when they're outperforming um, US and, and European and, and, and other, um, uh, other developers and engineers, right? There's, there's real knowledge here that doesn't, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. So there's real good talent here. There's real good knowledge bases here. Um, great, great pool of, of individuals to reach into. And it, I mean, it seems like there's jobs. I, I don't go, and this is kind of just uh, anecdotal, right? Because yep. this is me. I'm not looking at statistics or anything, but I mean, anecdotally speaking, if I'm traveling around uh, the, the area, going to stores, going to places, people are, they're there, they're frequenting um, restaurants and they're frequenting bars and they're going shopping in the malls and there there are people working in, in all of these places. So 
from that that perspective it it seems fine um yeah and are are there a lot of um that you know expats let's call them that working in el salvador you know people like you from maybe the us and europe or wherever and do you work out of some kind of like a a tech hub in the city or is there a whole business zone there that you work out of uh so there's some um we like the the street that we live on we actually randomly found out one day that there was a, a group of of expats working um but they were just working out of their house they didn't have an office so for for us we're not working out of like a tech hub mm-hmm. we have we have a specific office building that that we're in um and one of our our partner companies is also here in in the office so in that sense it's shared but it's not like a co-working tech hub expat spaced uh, mm-hmm. I think we're actually the only people not from El Salvador um, here in in this office. They're now they're looking to build a couple places like that. I do know that there's a few few groups that are looking to achieve exactly that. Um, and we we see we see expats occasionally, mm. but I, I wouldn't say when I visited Guatemala, I saw way more. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, you know, when you see that, uh, I, I guess there's certain attractive features that brings them in and maybe there are incentives offered by government agencies. Well, here, if if you get paid in Bitcoin, there's no tax. So mm-hmm. Bitcoin is tax free. So if you're if you're an expat, you're coming here. Uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, it doesn't really do you any good. Right. You can only claim up to one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in exemptions on salary base um, or I think any compensation base if you're a U.S. citizen. So I, I don't even get the benefit of that. But if you're not a U.S. citizen, you're an expat from another country that, and I think the U.S. is the only one that actually forces that, uh, or one of the only ones, then you can come here and El Salvador is not going to charge you any tax if you get paid in Bitcoin. And then if it's if you don't have any foreign taxes on that, then you're essentially not paying any tax to anybody. Great. Well, it seems you're real happy and like the lifestyle there and you like the coffee and just everything about um, El Salvador. I want to... Um, sort of take people through your entrepreneurial journey it started when you first developed the concept for a new video game back in 2021 uh coming out soon called cosmo gene you're gonna have to explain that with state-of-the-art technology and you were speaking with an uncle about how um he was intending how you were intending to join the marines um, you had apparently submitted the paperwork to join the U.S. Marines mm-hmm. um, after you dropped out of high school and acquired your GED. Uh, as it turns out, you were able to secure a $10,000 loan from your uncle to provide the startup capital for the game. And it sort of took off from there. And um, you worked on a lot of amazing projects Um the, that first, first iteration didn't make it to shelves, but it helped launch your career, a 14 year journey working on various startups, building games and commercial applications in government, getting involved in early crypto and NFT projects, and then eventually running the Star Wars digital business for the Tops company and building their NFT business. Wow, that's so much you've achieved so much you didn't go to college some of the best people i've ever ran into never went to college was maybe that's another reason you shouldn't go because all the successful people have figured a way around it but we're not knocking college but uh you've done it you've achieved success at a very early age um you just tell us all about that you must have an incredible technical mechanical intuitive sort of mind you know, you just don't do those things without being curious about how clocks work, how car engines work, how computers work, right? Yeah, car engines, not so much. Um, I probably, probably couldn't fix a, a car if the only thing wrong with it was the blinker was on. But um, <laughs> is, you know, what, what you were mentioning, right? So that was actually in in 2011. Um was was when I first had an idea to make a game, but it had nothing to do with cryptocurrency or, or AI or anything at the time. 
Uh, but I had always been pretty, I would say, intrigued by game development and narrative. So, so to me, having an individual, um, your your users or your players, it was always interesting how you could really engulf yourself in the narrative of of a good game. And sometimes the narrative didn't even have to be that strong. It just had to be immersive enough for you to fill in the gaps in your own head. And then that was the story to you. So that got me very interested at an early age on, on how games were made and how they were developed. And got, I kind of forced my way into to some game testing um, things at a young age. I ended up testing like World of Warcraft very, very young. I was on like the one of the initial beta testing um, uh, runs that they did and kept doing, doing that, uh, really trying to learn about how games were made. And then I, I had this idea in 2011, but I wasn't a good student. I was a, I was a horrible student in school. Um, if I, uh, if, if I was even attending, typically I, I was notorious for not even attending uh, class. And when I was attending, I probably wasn't paying attention. So I just always was wrapped up in the things that I was interested in, which ended up being how, how games were made um, and not even just gaming myself. So when I had this idea in 2011, I really wasn't sure what to do with it. And I wasn't sure what to do with, with my, my life. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm 17. I'm going to join the Marines, started filling out the paperwork, uh, was, was getting ready to go and ended up sitting down at, it was actually a wake, a family member of ours had passed away. And I was sitting with my, my uncle at, you know, they do like a brunch thing, uh, usually after, after the wake and told him what I was, what I was doing. Um, and he's like, I don't think you should join the Marines. And I was like, yeah, well, I don't know what to do. I had this idea for a game. I wanted to build it as an app. Um, and ultimately it led to him, him giving, uh, putting, putting money up for, for me to go and start that. And um, as you said, that idea didn't ultimately ship. Uh, we, we weren't able to, we raised money, developed for like a year, you know, a mobile game, and we just couldn't get it to where we needed to get it to. And then we couldn't raise any more money. And at the time, I didn't have any connections to VCs or anything. I was 17, 18 by the time that this was, was going on. Uh, didn't really have good connections. All the money we'd raised was family and friends. Um, so we, I held on to the IP. I, we, we shelved the project. I ended up doing some other things um, and that advanced my, my career. We ended up building mobile game, other mobile games, working with publishers. Uh, and then, as you said, that kind of eventually led into Tops reaching out to me and asking if I would come manage the, the Star Wars digital business that they had. So I did that was there for about a year and change a year and a half or so and helped turn that that business around um and got great experience working with with lucasfilm got to work with a whole bunch of the talent from the films did a, did a whole bunch of initiatives at tops uh even during covid managed a a web show where i was interviewing celebrities and building original content with disney master artists and and all these kinds of initiatives we had going around um and really all my experience of, of just from that, that very first project where I had to learn how game development was, was done properly, had to learn how, how uh, narrative is built, that kind of led in and, and um, from there snowballed. So, yeah. You no, know, um, so as a child, you like a lot of american kids european kids even you played a lot of games i guess from home right um game box or whatever they called them it was a i bypassed that um, a different generation but is that where um your love and and early understanding of gaming and games and consoles came from yeah i mean my my father was was into video games i i grew up around people that that like even the original you know the nintendo nes so i grew up with these with these systems even older ones like atari and vetrex um so things that are out of kind of my my age range for for what i would have grown up with i had been growing up with generations of games even before that mm -hmm. so i always always loved games always loved technology mm -hmm. um and that just stayed an interest for me for for my my whole life but it wasn't just playing I, I wasn't interested in just the escape you get with the game yeah. i was interested in 
how you build the escape for others. Uh, and that, that really followed through with, with everything. I mean, I, I've, I've also, since then, um, I was helping and, and working with the team to on, on content strategy for like what we were going to do with gamification of Bojack Horseman, um, and, and a number of other, other shows. Um, I had, I had done some, some advisory and work with, with Nickelodeon. We were working on some stuff for Avatar Last Airbender. Uh, so even, even outside of my, and I did a lot of this while I was uh, with the Tops team um, because I got exposure to all of these brands that we were licensors of and and companies that we were partnered with. So when I eventually made it into into that level of my career, I, I got to work with basically every major brand in existence <laughs> for for sports and entertainment. And I got to talk to the people that are were running those brands. And I got to be a part of discussions of how they were going to build out their content to engage all of all of their fans. And when you're talking about, you know, Major League Baseball, Bundesliga, WWE, Godzilla, um, Walt Disney, Star Wars, Marvel, when, when you're talking to all these brands, Nickelodeon, right? All of these brands that I got exposure to within the span of, you know, maybe three years working with heavily. Um, I think that just accelerated my, my love and, and my passion for, for entertainment and technology even further from where it had, had evolved into. And then ultimately that's why um, uh, after meeting my, my co-founders, I, I think we all agreed that we wanted to start sorting. Sortium, yeah. So it seems to me there's a there has been this ongoing confluence of events, developments, and changes even in the culture. Gaming, the internet arrives. Um, the Web three, which you can talk about, artificial intelligence, um, and just all this advanced technology. I mean, it's no coincidence that everything is all seemingly tied together you know, this NFTs even, and um, and then the generations, the younger generations, even older generations who are pioneering all these changes. Um, take us through that. Um, in some ways, you know, depending on who you talk to on the in this debate, Bitcoin is the future, although it's collapsed, it came back, it's volatile. Um, is it a currency? Will it ever go anywhere or should it be banned? That's one question. But um, on the other, there are plenty out there who embrace it and are pushing it forward. Um, where do you see all that? Uh, well, why don't we start with Web3? And, you know, I, I don't uh, know, know your viewer base too well. So I think it'll be great um, to also have context for anybody who doesn't know, even, even for yourself, perhaps. So web let's go back to to what web one is right and when the internet was created it was a network that allowed for reading of of papers and and articles so science papers it was uh, created for universities they, they were putting up their their papers you could go on you could read them um, and that's what it was. It was effectively read access of of the internet. You could go on and you could view things that the the parties that had decentralized information put on there. Um, that's how it started. It was as simple as that. Mm. Web two, which was probably a much well, it's effectively what we're just transitioning out of now. Uh, Web two is read and write access. This is where we started to get developments of your your email and your online personality or persona um, and profiles where. You know, you had stuff like MySpace emerging, Facebook comes around, you have messaging messaging apps uh, starting, and now the internet becomes this store of identity for yourself and a, a pool of, of information, but that information is centralized. Now we're relying on uh, Google and Amazon and, and Azure and, and all these companies to host our information and they ultimately have control of it. That's how they're able to monetize that information and earn revenue. Google, Google ads, Google companies selling your personal information because they're taking data points from what you're doing. So now we have a reliance on web two, but we don't own our own information anymore. Web three is a transition to, is a transition back 
to decentralizing that information. Now, instead of Google and Amazon and everybody else controlling that information, we're decentralizing the control of that information. So you spread the ownership of that across every participant in the network. So it'd be like you're taking out the middleman, right? And now you have full control over your your, um, virtual identity. And with this, we can also create a digital footprint and permanence to any kind of digital asset. So not just, it it could be your information, it could be medical records. Um, This is a a huge use case, I think that'll develop over the coming years. So right now, if if I go to a doctor here, they don't have my medical records. If something happens to me and for some reason, let's say if I had a, a history of, of an illness, which I don't fortunately, but if I did and I had to go to a doctor here, they have no idea what's going on with me. There's no way for them to get my medical records. They'd have to try and contact the, the medical office that I may have went to. But a great use case for Web3 is to decentralize medical records. So you have a universal uh, type or file or platform in which your medical records must be stored by every professional that you attend to. And then you, as the person, have control of those medical records, not the physicians and and doctors and and labs that are are using it. So that's one example, right? And that goes for for everything. You can do this with music, potentially. You can do this, of course, you've seen it done with profile pictures and images. And, you know, you can debate over whether or not copying an image is is the same as stealing it or, or whatever. But ultimately, you don't have control of that asset unless you are the holder of it. And that's what Web3 really provides. So it transitions us from uh, centralized control of data to a decentralized self-ownership of, of your information and data. And, and that's really as, as simple as, as it gets, right? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about uh, currency or NFTs and whatever that NFT might represent. NFT is a file format. That's, that's all it is. Everybody hyping like that NFTs are scams or it's this or it's that or it's or it's the best thing ever. Ultimately, it's just a file format that allows you to authenticate a digital asset. So I know if I own a picture that I have the original of that picture. And that's one way to that's a very simple way to put it. But it it is more about how the technology is applied um, in the future than what people are using it for right this moment. And that's why uh, I think it's almost damaging to the whole adoption and, and, and transition into Web3, even to mention things like blockchain and NFTs and people talk about you know nodes and decentralized networks. Uh, like if you go out and asked anybody this a few years ago about Web2, Nobody gives server their information was on, right? Nobody cares that or is interested in the fact that the server architect underneath your, uh, I don't know, your, uh, your, your favorite social media account is, is using an AWS bucket, right? Nobody talks about, nobody cares. Yeah. And it should be the same thing here. Nobody should care that it's an NFT or it's crypto. What you should care about is that it has been applied in a way that gives you the control and the security that you should expect for your your information. And that's, I I don't know, that'd probably be the the best explanation and and true um, value outlook of, of what Web3, at least Web3 is. Yeah, no, that's a great way to lay it all out and um, really interesting. I mean, you you mentioned there decentralization, Bitcoin, cryptos and all that. That's that concept again, decentralizing. But does that raise another issue of um, supervision, monitoring, um, oversight, by the government. I know when government is mentioned, especially big government, everybody screams or a lot of people do, you know, less of that, maybe we're we're all better off, but some level of regulation to keep things safe because if things get too decentralized, you risk other sets of problems, presumably. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, I don't think there's much harm in 
or much potential for harm in the decentralization of currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean that each nation's currency needs to be decentralized, mm-hmm. but the thing that Bitcoin and now w- with freedom comes the freedom of choice to use that for the right thing or the wrong thing, however you want to determine what that is, right? So um, yeah, Bitcoin has been used by terrorist organizations and and other bad acting parties that shouldn't exist and in a perfect world, but they, they do. And they're always going to abuse technology in their favor to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve. So I, I think looking at, at something like that on the extreme is not necessarily a great viewpoint because that's going to happen no matter what we can apply that to anything let's let's never build let's we should just argue let's never build another weapon let's never build let's just get rid of money as a whole because it's always going to be used for bad things and and that's unrealistic right so those things are going to happen um but it's also allowed people who don't or, or who are are kind of under the thumb of abusive governments to have access to their money and not be in constant fear that their entire net worth can be taken from them or that they can't possibly leave a bad situation in their country because there's they have no control. It's so there's just as many stories, if not more of that, than as there is on the other side. And it's like where, at what point it does regulation solve one but not hurt the other and i think in most cases um the answer is well it, it doesn't it, it it doesn't even really impact this and it hurts the person on, on the good side right because the bad actors are going to find a way to be bad actors with or without that technology and yeah. they're going to they're going to transfer wealth and they're going to do bad things and they're, they're going to continue doing what they're doing in different ways but the value that was brought by it, by the technology is what's being hurt by that regulation. And I personally, I'm not even against regulation if it's done in, in the right way. Um, but I think that many governments, and especially the U.S., has a horrible habit of not regulating in a way that is actually beneficial to the broad public. Um, and does it in a way that is more beneficial to maybe a few select individuals based on opinion viewpoints of subject matters as opposed to data-driven decisions. Mm. Uh, so that, you know, it, it, it'd be hard for me to say that I think it, maybe if the right people were in charge, good regulation could be put in place. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence that whether and not just the US, I don't have a whole lot of confidence that most uh, established countries should be putting their nose in in regulating an international currency um, or a technology that is imperative to the growth of humanity, like uh, the internet and, and the development of, of Web 2, Web 3, and, and so on. Well, you could add to that fiat currency, there's money laundering involved with fiat currency, people bandits use it, drug cartels and so on. Um, mm-hmm. But um, in terms of um, the adoption of Bitcoin taking and El Salvador, and it has its currency tied to the US dollar, and it has its own economic challenges. I, I suspect that was motivated it, as we spoke about earlier. Uh, to to maybe latch on, let's say that the president latched on and promoted the Bitcoin. Um, but you, how then do we explain, um, or is there any connection, or these whole separate issues, the collapse of FTX exchange and other exchanges and platforms in the Bitcoin crypto space, are they all separate from this argument and what you're talking about? Because you know, if there'd been more oversight maybe at FTX, then we wouldn't have had that massive uh, collapse that we saw. Um, yeah, but also, I mean, more oversight, how, and then maybe this will make some people upset, but like how stupid do you have to be to give somebody billions of dollars without doing proper due diligence? Hmm. 
right? Like, I mean, we, we're talking to investors and, and we just completed a, an investment round and it's, it's incredible the amount of drilling in investors will do for a, a couple million dollars in an investment. I, I can't even fathom how you would provide funding to a crypto financial institution and not have some kind of oversight. That's not the government. That's the, that's the fault of the investors and putting money into an organization without proper oversight is just ludicrous. So I, I feel bad for nobody on the investor side. I feel bad for the people that got conned into putting their money into a financial institution, thinking that it was going to be safe um, because they listened to those in investors and the people running and managing the company. But it it is, I, I have no sympathy whatsoever for any investor that lost their money in FTX. It is 100% their own fault for not doing proper due diligence. And this goes for many, many crypto investments. You have a ton of VCs and a ton of investors that are simply, they're not, they're not educated. They're not performing due diligence. They're in, I watched last year when we first, we did our first raise, we, we had our, our plans together. We had our financials together. We had, we had everything together for Swartium as a company. And then we tried to get a reasonable valuation on what Sortium and the technology was worth. And during that time, we watched another company raise at a $300 million valuation. And all they had was, I think it was a 10 page PDF that described a game they wanted to build. And they did not have a team to build it. They did not have technology. They had nothing. And they raised successfully $300 million. I can almost wow. guarantee you that the investors in that, in, in that round lost all of their money and they absolutely should have. How do you not look into an investment beyond a 10 page PDF, right? And the same thing was happening just at a larger scale in these financial institutions, such as FTX, where nobody is, they're giving all this money to a group. They're not overseeing how the money is being spent and they're not overseeing the people that are managing it or, or the fact that these people have never managed that level of capital before in their life. So it's it should have been red flags all the way through. It's the end result is not surprising, and the only thing I can say is, uh, hopefully, people learn their lesson. Um, but I don't think that's correlated to what's necessarily happening in, in El Salvador, right? Or or why maybe it's some correlation to why the price of Bitcoin and, and other cryptos are down a bit as a market as a whole. Yeah. But the entire economic market is down. It's not like the it's it's not like traditional markets are on on a huge rise and we're looking at the 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 growth of the economy across the board internationally it's like every country is facing major they're they're staring major economic crisis in the face yeah and then in addition of course there's also economic downturn in in the crypto space i mean it, it just seems obvious anybody who thinks that those things are not correlated it, there's not enough wealth in crypto as a whole to to decouple it from the global markets. Yeah, well, there's great fear and uncertainty in the global markets, economies, uncertainty um, being an understatement. You know, we've rising interest rates in America and yet record number of jobs being created, two for one, you know, uh, two jobs for every one available worker. Explain all that um, and rising consumer and national debt. It's quite bizarre, you know, economists can't explain it and they're getting all their, ex you know, market expectations, you never take them too seriously, but they were widely off the mark, you know, in the most recent jobs report in America, it's really strange. But just picking you up real quickly though, you said, you know, you didn't feel sorry or whatever language you, you used there for investors and FTX. I, I think I would have to draw a line between sophisticated investors and ordinary mom and pops and school teachers and you know blue collar workers or whatever you, you know who yeah, just no, simply, that, you know, who simply have no concept of finance and they see sam bankman fried being interviewed on cnbc you know you know on the beach in um bermuda or wherever he was or bahamas you know mm. i mean he was propped up by all the 
celebrities even out there, you know? Well, that, that's exactly what I meant when I was saying I, I feel bad for people who got conned by FTX. And that's the mom and pops of the, the non-institutional investors who put mm -hmm. their money into a system because they believe the celebrities that were involved with him, they believe the the investors that put their money behind him, big money behind him. Those people definitely, uh, I, I feel bad for and should have been, those are the ones that should have been set right. Um, they, and I, I hope that in the future that they do. The people I don't feel bad for are the celebrities and the institutional investors, the people that are supposed to be educated investors and are supposed to be sophisticated investors. They have these processes. They're managing people's money. Those are the ones I don't feel bad for. They deserve everything that's coming to them. But the people who did not deserve it is the everyday blue collar folks that put their money into that system under false pretenses that were reinforced by authoritative parties that were investing and, and promoting this platform. Yeah. And um, Charlie Munger at Berkshire Hathaway has called for the banning of crypto uh, following in the footsteps of, uh, of the Chinese leadership. Really interesting to see that call. Yeah, I, I think that we're we're putting blame on the wrong thing, right? Like we're not blaming the, the bad actor. We're blaming the, the tool that they, they use. And it's like that's not that doesn't solve anything. Right. It's the same issue that we were just talking about before, where ultimately you're you're not addressing the the problem banning crypto isn't going to one it's not going to stop anybody from using it it just yeah. isn't and and two it's just not going to fix the issue make sure that hold the investors accountable make sure that if they don't have if they're investing into these or they're promoting this platform hold the people accountable that are effectively taking and losing people's money that's that's where the accountability should be don't don't blame the the technology it's it's who's using it and how they're using it that's the problem so mark again you're the co-founder and ceo of sortium and you're currently focused on applying blockchain and non-fungible token technologies to the digital gaming and entertainment spaces where you aim to build immersive digital experiences with worldwide appeal and top level engagement speaking to what you addressed earlier, that's just mind blowing, really mind blowing. It's like, where is this going? <laughs> so um, ultimately what, what Sortium has done is we, we have built our own technology and we've taken our expertise in pipeline creation. And that, that sounds maybe a little bit, that's part of it sounds maybe boring, but it's actually the magic of, of what we do. And it's because we have deep experience with, Web3, artificial intelligence, gaming, that we can build um, like a workflow that lets these technologies engage with each other. And that's the core of, of what we've built. Uh, what we're going to be moving into now is we, we have a game that's coming out that demonstrates our technology utilizing artificial intelligence um, and Web3, which is Cosmogene, what, what you said earlier. And then Sortium is going to also be offering our an interface to our technology that allows people to create. So using natural language interfaces, so type, talking, typing to to a chat the way that you would text your your friends or whatever, um, and effectively talking to it as you would if you wanted an art team to make you something. You know, I want to I want to make a tree that looks like it's from an alien world. I want to have grass. One of this and generating content for you based on this, um, but usable content. There's a lot of innovation right now in, in AI generative uh, 3D assets and art, um, but most of it's not functional. It, and it's, it has to start this way, but what we're doing is we're creating the ability for all of these new artificial intelligence models and Web3 technology to interact so we can generate uh, dynamic content and that could be anything. It could be objects in a game or a film, or it could be if you have a character uh, that you're playing and something happens to your character, let's say it's a medieval game and you get cut across the face. Well, it, traditionally speaking, we'd have to make a whole bunch of assets, do all different kinds of things so that showing that is possible. But with AI and Web3, what we can do is um, we can actually generate these kinds of things dynamically. So it could it could be 
a scar. It could be even your backstory. Maybe something happened to your family that motivates you in, in this medieval game. Um, and all of that is kind of immortalized through Web3. So your story in content becomes dynamic. It becomes fluid and truly based on your actions. It makes the storytelling and the immersion richer because it's it's truly unknown. The way that you could walk out into the world and anything can happen, you kind of get that level of, of flexibility where now instead of having, if somebody wanted to do this years ago, you'd have to write a thousand different scripts and paths and all different things. But now we could actually have you in a game where you approach a, a character you've never seen before and no artist has ever created. It was generated through artificial intelligence. You interact with this character and you've just generated a unique story, a story that only you have experienced, um, but could potentially extend to, to others as well. So this is the foundations of the technology that we've, we've built. Um, it's geared primarily at, at the, the creators of, of content, uh, knowing that we, we think it'll also empower kind of anybody um, to, to, be more more creative and, and achieve more on their own uh, than they would have been able to prior. Um, so with these games, um, the you know I'm going to ask some elementary things. Uh, you watch them on a big screen, your television set screen. Are they three dimensional in 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 style? I guess. I mean, you mentioned you almost bring. You may you create this very real feeling almost in the characters and in the narrative and in the gaming. Yeah, so I, I mean, it, it could be anything, right? The the technology we built is more about how content is is generated. We're starting with three D um, assets, so uh, which is used in in most modern games and film today. Um, is uses uh, uh, 3D assets like Unreal Engine and, and stuff like that. So um, yes to 3D, it, it could be 2D too, right? It's also about storytelling, mm -hmm. using using AI to generate, uh, think of it like, have, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons or seen Dungeons and Dragons? Well, my kids have. Okay, yeah. So, and, and that's probably, you know, one of the things that Dungeons and Dragons does so well, and I've only played it maybe maybe once or twice, but um, one of the things that it does so well is it kind of gives freedom to the people who are playing it to make the story whatever they want. And that's not really possible in in games and and film, right? Because you need you need script writers, you need to make the content for it. But in Dungeons and Dragons, it's effectively just a bunch of friends sitting around a table imagining what these worlds could be. So now, if you think about what, what we're doing, it's kind of giving that ability to people so that they can visualize it in a video game. Mm -hmm. and, and now they have the capacity to have that same level of full creative freedom and reign, but in, in a game. And what they don't have to do is they don't need somebody writing the story for them. So you don't need a dungeon master, as, as they call it in Dungeons and Dragons, who's writing the story, narrating, saying what's happening. Now we can have artificial intelligence do it. And we can do this in a very natural way that feels organic to, to the world that, that's being built. So, um, and it doesn't have to be direct interaction either. It could be running into a character and their script is totally written by AI. That personality can be stored in, in on blockchain through web three. So that character is permanent and everything that happens to them and with them uh, has a long lasting effect on kind of the history books of that game. So it's, it's not 3d or 2d or this, it's, it's really just about interactive entertainment as a whole um, and providing now the, the technology foundations to to do this and there's a lot of developers in the space who are making more and more artificial intelligence systems and as those develop and progress we will be able to integrate them into that that pipeline that i was talking about that workflow mm -hmm. so 
that they can be a part of and, and help accelerate the the offering of of what sorting is bringing to the table. So we not only work in artificial intelligence and train our own models, we also leverage all of the the work that uh, other great um, technologists and and scientists and everybody are doing in the AI space, so that we can kind of give quicker access to that technology to to creators. Yeah, I, I'm imagining also advances in. Um you know, playrooms and people's homes where a whole room will have fulls of filled with screens and sound effects, 3D, 2D, um, you know, where the family or kids or neighbor, you know, will gather to do all these kind of um, interesting games, if you will call that. I mean, almost like creating their own Disney fantasies at home. Yeah, I, I think that's very, um, very possible, you know, in, in the short term, what I think we'll see is maybe more adoption with with VR as VR headsets and, and glasses, a, a augmented reality glasses as, as this technology kind of downsizes. So it's a little bit more um, mainstream adoptable. Mm -hmm. I think these technologies will help lead to kind of just infinite immersive content. But then what Sortium is doing is we're enabling the creation of that content. So there will be kind of a, a, a technology catch up perhaps to, to some of this. Um, but today, right, what, what, we've, what we've built and what we're working on, you can experience this on your phone. You could experience a, something made with this on your computer or, or watch it, of course, on, on your screen. Um, it's, it's not really dependent on a viewing medium and and it won't be so however the medium in which you experience the content evolves uh this this technology is what's going to be creating the actual content um so it could it could be uh holodeck style rooms 10 years from now or it could be headsets or anything yeah well we're almost out of time mark um uh, curious to know how you're going to market this get it broadly distributed sold Will you, your company do it? Will you sell it to another company with a bigger footprint in the global marketplace or what's your thoughts? So, um, well, one is Cosmogene is coming out and that's kind of a demonstration of what the technology can do. So Cosmogene is, is about virtual pets, genetic engineering, and we're going to be utilizing artificial intelligence to make all of the uh, creatures that, that are your virtual pets. They all have DNA that's stored. So we actually encode them with digital DNA that's stored on, on blockchain. And then you'll be able to interact with them. Each one has its own artificial intelligence personality that you'll be able to interact the, the kind of the way that we are now. You'll be able to type to it, to talk to it, and eventually we'll, we'll um, provide features so you can literally talk to it and get reactions back. Um, so th that's one is, is kind of like our market demo of of the technology and then we're working now um we have a couple of big studios film studios game development studios that we're talking to about utilizing the the technology uh so that in in the games and the content that that they're making um and really driving dynamic immersive storytelling in in their games and and some actually highly popular um film property that already exists today that, that people would know if we talked about. How is the internet and digital infrastructure in El Salvador? Must be good or you wouldn't be there. Depends on the day. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, our, we got our, a little our, bit of a shaky reception briefly. I don't know if it was in El Salvador or here in New York, probably. but I'm going to blame El Salvador. Yeah, I, I probably would too. Um, it depends. I mean, the internet infrastructure here is certainly not up to par with with the U.S., but it's it's been reliable enough um, that that you know high speed internet is is fine. Um, we can do video calls. Obviously, sometimes it kicks out. I had a video call yesterday where we had fifteen people on, and for the most part, held up okay. Yeah, yeah. And like you go to Africa these days, and it's quite amazing if you go to Africa today and you had visited maybe. 20, 30 years earlier, you know, you see people today in some of these big cities in Africa with, you know, all on their cell phones, doing digital banking on the internet, um, mm -hmm. embracing technology, whereas in the past, they sort of were left behind technologically. Any sort of 
does that does that El Salvador? How does it stack up on that one? I mean, technically, their national currency is Bitcoin, right? So um, yeah, they're he heavily reliant on on technology. But I think we're moving into a point where it should almost be deemed basic human rights to have access to food, shelter, water. And now you're going to have internet. And I think in the next handful of years, it's going to be AI. I think you're, people are going to be at a massive disadvantage. The way that somebody would be at a massive disadvantage now, if they didn't have access to the internet in the next, well, honestly today, but easily in the next couple of years, not having access to uh, artificial intelligence is going to be the same issue. Um, you'll be at a huge disadvantage if you aren't using it, you don't have access to it, and you're not leveraging it. Um, so the, I don't think that's this is going to be, you know, Africa is not going to be any different than the US. The, the It's going to become a, a basic need for people to just keep up with each other. That's interesting. So, so, so AI is what electricity supply was in many countries, you know, back in, you know, when every country was catching up. I mean, America had electricity before most of Europe, but it's sort of on that scale that if you don't have AI, you're going to step back. You know, an economy is going to have the, the economies that have AI are going to be ahead of the game versus countries that don't have AI and on the same level. Yeah. And it's not even going to be close, right? Like somebody with, this is happening now. We, we tell our developers, we tell our engineers, we tell our artists, you better be use, utilizing artificial intelligence tools in your day-to-day -day workflow and life. Otherwise you will be left behind and nobody's going to be able to save you. You're, you're, People who are afraid of it, they're they're not. Nobody's going to lose their jobs to AI. They're going to lose their jobs to a person using AI. That's that's going to be the ultimate result. Um, there's a there's a lot of you know fear and and talk about you know AI people going to lose their jobs to AI. That's not true. They're going to lose their jobs to a person who has learned to integrate it into their job and life. Yeah. Um, and it's it's not some huge learning curve, right? Everybody is going to be, everybody has the capacity. If you can type a text message or write an email, you can interface with what's called a large language model um, and you can utilize AI. And AI and Web3 are both hyper accelerated technologies, AI more so than, than Web3. But I think as they come together, which is exactly what we're doing, uh, as these technologies come together to to help facilitate progress. I feel over the next decade, we're going to see the fastest rate of technological advancement that we've ever seen in, in the in history, not, not correlated to- The to fastest anything. rate of technological advancement in the, in the next decade. Yeah. It, in the West, in the US, El Salvador, or whatever countries are- uh, It's not gonna have borders. It's going to be it's going to be global um, because it, as Internet is decentralized and as AI becomes readily available, I mean, the cat's already out of the, the bag, so to speak. AI exists. The models exist. It's been demonstrated how they work, how they're made. People are already making derivatives of these models that are not controlled by big corporations that are free and accessible. And it's going to become it, it's a it's just a new technology race and we're in the start of it now could you give us a few simple examples of how our lives could be different or will be different uh in 10 years compared to today what will be so radically different what can we expect what should we prepare for um i mean it's, it's hard to envision exactly all the ways that that this will be be implemented right but i could give you a couple of examples now, right? And we just talked about content generation. So the the film and entertainment industry, instead of needing 2000 people to make a game, you might need 10, right? I mean, a huge, huge reduction in need of, of staff. And the reason for that is because those 10 people are doing the work with AI of those 2000 people. So it's a hyper acceleration of certain workflows um, and certain kind of logical flows. Things like, 
things today that that people do um that are like de- maybe desk jobs desk desk jobs will, will be reduced drastically if if something if your job can be done at a computer it can be done a thousand times faster and better if somebody's using ai ultimately that's just that's just what it's going to end up being and some of the models are are flawed today right like the the large language models aren't great at like math today for instance but that's a simple simple issue to fix um so there, there's little things that people might nitpick at today but from now to 10 years those things will not be and i think it's going to get difficult even for people to to determine and distinguish whether or not they're even interacting with a person or they're interacting with an ai and uh, so a lot of a lot of jobs could be one person or a couple people managing a bunch of like AI employees that are accomplishing well-defined tasks. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, speculating here right on a call over, over a couple minutes is difficult to really nail yeah. down and go through all the, all the possibilities, yeah. but it's going to, it's already drastic. <laughs> There's already, if you were in the space, there's already a massive, massive shift because of this. And it's going to, it, it's going to be the same kind of technological shift as when the internet was first made. Yeah. So a lot of jobs will be um, eliminated and new jobs will be created. Um, we won't recognize this new world in 10 years if we look back compared to today. Uh, I'm just thinking of some jobs that could potentially be modified, adjusted or eliminated. Teachers, accountants, um, service workers. um, You mentioned creators, obviously. um, And I'm sure there's a lot of other categories. I mean, how will that shake out? Um, I mean, I I think we'll get a lot more, each person, each individual will get a lot more value out of themselves and a corporation will get a lot more value out of an individual utilizing AI, right? Ultimately that's, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's hard to say how many jobs be eliminated. It could also lead to more expansion. You know, you might, uh, the same staff that exists today might be able to cover a wider range. It might actually make it much easier for countries that are, are underdeveloped in their infrastructure to organize better. And, and have better um, structure in place for for systems. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a, it's not like a doom and gloom look yeah. on jobs are going to shift, they're going to adapt, and there's going to be need for, for people, um, but it also might just make people's lives easier. I, I think there's a lot of talk about like universal basic income and that kind of thing. It could open the doorway for that being feasible. Um, I, you know, and, and maybe it is already feasible. I, I, I don't, I don't know, but like it, it could open a whole bunch of other possibilities. I don't think the world in 10 years is going to look like the Jetsons, but I think that the way that we recognize things today are not going to be how they are, are in 10 years. And you know, that I, I don't even, people probably 10 years from now won't even realize until they're having conversations. Anybody who's not in the space and watching this, they're not even going to know they're going to get a new phone or they're going to get some new device and they will be like, Oh, look at the new version of this Microsoft assistant, and they're going to start using it the same way that my mother has um, an Amazon echo and, and she uses Siri on her phone. And if you talked to her 10 years before that and said that she was barely using a cell phone, right? Like, so it's, it's that level of, of progression. Uh, nobody's going to be sitting here 10 years from now. And we're going to be like, Oh my God, this, this happened. And, and we're living in the world of Jetsons and it's ridiculous. It's going to be, Probably for most, um, they're not even going to know that they transitioned into this, but they'll be utilizing this technology day to day and they won't be questioning that their accountant is just their phone just does it right. Well, my phone, my phone does my accounting. My, my phone keeps track of all my banking. My phone does all of my investments for me. I don't, I don't do that. And my phone does all my scheduling. I, you know, people won't have assistance or something or maybe, Right. And they'll just be saying, well, my devices do all these things for me. I don't, I don't do this. It's like I have, it's like I have a thousand personal assistants doing all of the things and tedious things I don't want to do is being done for me in this one device that I paid maybe a thousand bucks for, right? Which is basically an iPhone. 
Yeah. And that's the world that we're going to live in where people probably take this stuff for granted and they don't understand what, what happened to get there. Um, but the same way, if you take, you take most people's phones away and they have a meltdown because they're not connected anymore. <laughs> same thing. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But there's a lot of real rich possibilities here. And when I mention teachers, it might um, it might embellish the role of teachers. They might have a value added. But it also strikes me that countries which are in the ranks of the less developed may leapfrog suddenly into the ranks of the most developed. So watch AI. You know, well, I said earlier, uh, we were almost out of time and we've had this extended conversation because it was getting engrossing and I, I just couldn't, you know, end the conversation, Mark. But I, any plans to come back to the States to visit your family real quick? Do you miss the United States on our way of life here? Yeah, I mean, I have I have a place in Miami, I have a place in New York, um, and I I love being there. I'm going to be in, in New York in two weeks, and then I'm also going to be going through through Denver for an event. Um, I still tr spend as much time as I can in the States. It's just, I, I enjoy being here with the team and building. Yep. So try and spend as much time here as I can. Uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, I, New York is still my, my home, uh, and I'm never going to go anywhere where I feel the food is better than New York. So <laughs> Mark Seal on that note. Thank you. Thank you for having me.